Greetings, travelers. Crystal Tower Story, poorly summarized, will contain spoilers for A Realm Reborn and The Binding Coils of Bahamut. I will also put some Shadowbringer spoilers towards the end of the video, but I will warn you for that ahead of time. On with everything else. First up, a suspicious man in Mordona who you definitely haven't met before tells us about some really cool stuff to check out in slightly more southeast Mordona. This area is a place where they are exploring the ancient ruins of Alleg- Oh dude, is that Sid? Yo, what's going on, my guy? Ah, I see that you are trying to explore that very big tower that is made of crystal that came up out of the ground after that calamity that happened that may or may not have been related to a moon crashing into the planet and something to do with Bahamut. Sid wants us to remember that the Alligans created the ultimate weapon that we fought and that Nero and the garlic seasoning simply made it function again. That's neat. Unfortunately, trying to get close to this big tower causes everything to explode into flames. That yeah, seems pretty reasonable. So, you want us to do a bunch of chores to help you get past the laser field and get into the crystal tower. Understood. Somehow, while finding four crystals in two aether sands, we meet Biggs and Wedge again, which is cool. Unfortunately for us, some unknown voice stole the third aether sand we were trying to get before we could. Thankfully, we were able to get the fourth one that we needed before it was stolen ahead of us. This impresses the unknown voice that stole the third aether sand so much that he gives us the sand that he took earlier. With all of the resources, we give everything to Sid, and he makes what we need to bust into the Crystal Tower. Biggs and Wedge also decide to join us for real, and that unknown voice that taunted us with the Aether Sand is actually this cat boy named Familiar Voice. Okay, his name is Grahatia. He's here to observe. Spectacularly. So let's all get real excited to break into some ancient ruins and pillage them. On the way in, Grahatia shoots an arrow to prove that once again those force fields are still operational. Sid risks his own life in order to prove that his invention works. Honestly, kind of a power move. So we all take turns making it through those barriers. We are informed that in order to get to the actual crystal tower, we're going to need to get through the ruins before it, simply known as the Labyrinth of the Ancients. We have to secure the area, so leave no survivors and then contact Rahatia when we are all done, even though he really wanted to join us. Looks like it's time for another round of whose alliance raid is it anyways, where four people don't stand on the pads, people pull Thanatos too early so that all of Alliance A doesn't get the buff to hit the boss in the first place, and you wipe to Ancient Flare. After that amazing experience of killing many creatures and people, everyone agrees that this place is very big. Rahatia mentions that thanks to all of his knowledge about ancient history, that dude who casts Ancient Flare was actually an elegant hero. Also, the Crystal Tower was created to capture sun energy. Yeah, what a coincidence. Also, this tower brings heroes back to life. Wait, what? Beware the JPEG of the Crystal Tower, which is where we are actually going to go next. Although, we're going to have to have a little powwow first. Given that everything in the Labyrinth of the Ancients tried to kill us, it is safe to assume that the Crystal Tower is, in fact active, and we probably want to make it dormant again. I happen to know some people who can work on that problem. Ah yes, here we go. It's the mysterious man who gave us the first quest in this whole thing. This guy is Nero. You know, that guy who helped awaken the ultimate weapon, talked to Sid for about three minutes, and then got beat up afterwards. That one that I also briefly mentioned for a second earlier in this video. He's mostly just here to monologue and explain that he's loosely involved in this plot and that the Crystal Tower is powerful. Back at camp, we have tried nothing and we are all out of ideas. Thankfully, two characters show up out of nowhere called Une and Daga, who are scholars of the Alligans. This is strange, as we did not get a message from the Baldessian place about more people coming to help. I'm sure that this is not something I need to be concerned about. Grahatia's eye doesn't seem happy about this recent development. Oh yeah, by the way, Grahatia has a red eye, which he inherited from his father, and his father's father, and you get the idea. These two people also have red eyes, which means they are all somehow bound to the fate of Alig in some way. However, they don't have anything to add to Grahatia's arsenal of information about the Red Eye. This is the whole reason why Grahatia studies the Alligans so much, because he wants to understand the Eye of Sauron. So with all of this, we decide to accept this not-suspicious duo's help. 
Alright, Sid. How are we going to break into this place? Glad to see that the lava was not a problem. Door stuck, he said. Good thing that we have those two helpers here to break into the circus tower, as it's actually called. The only clue that we have to open this door is that it has a man and a woman carved into it. You know, on second thought, this all makes a lot of sense. It's really just that easy. Nero is here to explain that those two have to be considered Allegan royalty in order to open that door. Also, Nero mentions that he left Garlemald because they are going to kill him for real if he ever goes back. Did I say royalty? What I really meant to say is clones of royalty to become living, sentient keys. Seems like a massive waste of research and technology to me, but I digress. So now that we know that these two are not actually students of the Baldessian, we agree to trust the clones anyways and Nero. Because honestly, why not? We have to trust someone at some point, and I don't really feel like doing a quest as a trust exercise. Also, Nero gave Sid a piece of candy. That's pretty trustworthy. Time for a little history lesson. The Allegans were big and powerful long before these two were created. Things were so good that they couldn't get any gooder, and the nation began to slowly decline. I guess stagnation wasn't really an option. With things not looking so hot, a certain person named Amon decided that what Alec needed was a strong leader. More specifically, he wanted to bring Alec's founding father back to life. His name is Emperor Zande. So these two were made as clones first before making a clone of the real deal. So yeah, the history books mentioned there being two ruler Zandes, and they were actually the same person. The second leader, being the first leader, brought back to life. Anyways, the Empire was great again under the resurrected Zande, but he also had a very weird habit of wanting to take over the entire world. So he tried to harness the power of darkness itself to start his world domination. Sid mentions that the Emperor must have failed, but that's where he's wrong. Because the Emperor is alive, still trying to take over the world. Also, the moon was created during this time to help soup up the crystal tower for the whole darkness thing, but this also caused the fourth umbral calamity. I honestly don't even really remember at this point. But this fourth-ish calamity is also what buried the crystal tower. Amon put everything inside of the tower into time stasis before it was completely buried in the calamity, and this is why everything is still completely functional and alive inside of the tower. So that's the end of your history lesson. Since we were able to complete the Labyrinth of the Ancients in Duty Finder, that's why these two think that we are capable of killing Zande and ending his ambitions. This is how you easily gain trust, folks. So yeah, time to go save the world yet again. Before we go, though, Grahatia has to ask about his eye to make sure that we don't miss out on some additional lore. Doga says that clones are incapable of having children. Therefore, Grahatia is probably a real Alligan. At least he thinks only royals could have red eyes, so even though Grahatia wants to know the truth, he's going to learn in time. Yeah, you will probably get the rest of that exposition later. Well, that was fast. With the tower exploration out of the way and killing Zande, we have to figure out how to stop the tower. That would involve either sealing it off forever, or stopping it from absorbing energy. Also, that distortion that you see in the air is the darkness that the Emperor is trying to utilize. In this case, it's quite literally a link to the World of Darkness, as they call it, which is the home of the Void Scent. You know, those creatures that appear in some plot lines and also might be related to an entire job at this point in the game. So in order to make a deal with the Void, Zande agreed to let them eat all of the Aether in our dimension. So Doga says that Zande entered that covenant, and since they technically have the Allegan royal blood as well, they can undo said covenant. Nero gets real excited when the duo try to break the seal because look at all that energy. Also, the covenant cannot actually be broken. Yeah, I never saw that one coming. Look at all these friendly people here to welcome us. It's time for an echo headache, I guess. Man, the timing on these are always impeccable. Alright, Emperor Flashback. He took over Alig. Again. Dying once seems to have really left an emotional impact. Guess he didn't play enough Sekido. He simply says that wealth and power is horrible because you're going to lose it all eventually. Therefore, mankind should lose everything now so they don't know the pain of losing it all later. All of this does seem a little extreme, don't you think? 
I feel like everyone losing their lives is not exactly the same as losing all of their wealth and power. I guess I can't really relate though because I'm not part of the bourgeoisie. Thanks for helping us out, Graha. You know, these Echo Migraines somehow haven't gotten us killed, ever. Oh no, they appeared to be spreading. The biggest plot twist here is that Sid does know how to defend himself. Nero also just fucking shot a man, holy shit. And Doga has been eaten by the Void. Oh wait, I mean both of them have been eaten by the Void. Nero wants the dark power so much, he also jumps into the Pool of Darkness and gets eaten by the Void. So the Cloud of Darkness leaves us with a promise of destruction, and everyone is dead, the portal is sealed, and there is nothing that we can do. Alright, fine, we go back to camp to try to figure out a way to save everybody that got eaten by the Portal of Darkness. Grahatia reveals to us that his eye hurts, and that there is something that he needs to remember about this eye, but simply can't. So we all leave for a while, and then come back. The tower is getting ready to open another portal to the void. Unfortunately, the only people who can control the tower need Allegan blood. Too bad we don't know anyone with Allegan blood, not a single soul. So the only option is to rescue the Not Twins from the World of Darkness and use their ability to seal the tower. We can now open a portal whenever the portal opening device is actually ready. I just leave it to Sid. Anyway, since we have to wait around for a little bit, Grahatia tells us that there were those who fought against the Alligans in the past. They were the beacons of hope to those that had suffered at the hands of yet another empire. In order to crush this amazing uprising, that is why Zande sucked all the energy out of the moon and caused the fourth Umbral Calamity. Sid, overhearing this, comments that Grahatia sure knows a hell of a lot, and Grahatia says that he made it all up on the spot. Portal's ready, by the way. Sid's going to remain here and keep the portal open, and it's up to you, the Warrior of Light, to save the world yet again. Except before that, Catboy over here still wants to talk again, so let's go do that. Alright, what is it? You want to join us in the World of Darkness because you believe it to be your destiny. Sure, buddy. Well, that was easy enough. Insert comment about all DPS in the belly. Alright, with the Cloud of Darkness defeated, we still haven't found anybody, except Nero, Daga, and Une. Also, Nero looks totally normal. His Aether is corrupted because he isn't protected from the darkness, unlike those two who have some amount of protection thanks to the whole Blood Covenant thing. It doesn't really need to make sense. The Warrior of Light is probably protected by the Blessing of Light, and Grahatia is probably protected by his Red Eye, but we don't really know that right now. Although technically an important note, off screen, Nero did defend everybody from getting killed by the Void Scent even though he's being a fucking tsundere about it. Lo and behold, we didn't actually defeat the Cloud of Darkness. The Not Twins say that they're going to stay here and try to destroy the Covenant once and for all while we all make our escape. Only for Grahatia to become immune to damage, showing us that he does, in fact, have the Emperor's blood in his system. In other other words, he can control the Crystal Tower. In order to give Grahatia two eyes, the two of them give him their strength. I do actually think that lore-wise, this isn't them giving their power to Grahatia, merely awakening Grahatia's potential. But I'm the one that's making this stuff up on the spot. Eucalyptus over here gives Nero his energy measuring device back and says that he's not going to find any power here, but he can find power elsewhere. So it's time for us to make our escape. We just need to walk on this very long and very skinny floating platform. If thou wishest to triumph, thou must look towards the light. Sadly, Nero's sprint is on cooldown. He simply says to leave him here and let him die on his own terms, because all he wanted to do was harness the power of darkness and outdo both Alig and Sid. Power rankings confirmed. Grahatia gets a message from somewhere that the Crystal Tower should become a beacon of hope for humanity again, instead of an icon of despair. Did you really think that Nero would give up? The clone simply gave him another chance. In the end, he also has to get a little help from Sid. This makes Nero simply say, fuck you. So with all of that, we are back at the Crystal Tower. We can seal it off for good now, thanks to Grahatia getting two eyes, and thanks to the two sacrifice. Grahatia simply wishes that he could have been of more assistance, and he also finally remembers what he is supposed to remember. With that revelation, he sends us all away to talk later, definitely not plotting anything. Also, as far as anyone knows, someone, somewhere, instilled the royal Alligan blood into Grahatia's family. Nero also simply pieces out. 
and Grahatia has made everyone leave the Crystal Tower and no one knows what's going on. We all go to the Crystal Tower and Grahatia reveals that he's going to seal the tower away with him inside it. He says that it was his family's wish for the Crystal Tower to become a beacon of hope for humanity. After the fourth calamity, one of the Allegan royals lived, the Princess of Salami. She was the one who instilled the royal blood into Grahatia's family. This is great and everything, but Sid mentions that the world cannot possibly handle the power of the tower. Grahatia says, yes, but what if we put the tower to sleep until the world can handle its power? Since Grahatia is effectively the only person left in the universe who can control said tower, he says he's going to go into stasis because that is his destiny. Everyone else, though, they have destinies elsewhere. Out there somewhere in the world, probably in slightly more northwest Mordona. He can't wait to hear about all the legends of the Warrior of Light when he is awoken in the distant future, and he's gone. So we all leave, trying to live up to Grahatia's expectations to become worthy of waking him back up. And I guess Nero is technically here too in the closing cutscenes, and with him throwing that random thing away, it's time for the end. Roll credits. We are now entering the Shadowbringer spoiler territory for anyone who wants to turn the video off. I'll give you a second. I'm only including this because giving some thoughts on this story does make me want to spoil a couple of things. In an even shorter story summary, the Crystal Tower story explains that the Allegans might as well be responsible for the 4th and the 8th Umbral Calamities thanks to the Tower and to the Moon. Amon is the person who made a bunch of clones and brought people back to life, which I'm sure is not going to be important to the MSQ. Grahatia is the only person left in the universe who could ever control the Crystal Tower, which is why he sealed himself away and put himself into stasis for the tower to be used in the future. So with all of that, it is not too surprising that Grahatia is the Crystal Exarch in the end. There is a lot that has to happen for that to make sense, and it's a big part of Shadowbringers. Although I do think it's a nice tie into the story that the Crystal Tower does become a beacon of hope in the first, which is ultimately what Grahatia promised to his forefathers in a very roundabout way. He's also able to make his own personal dream of going on an adventure become a reality on top of that, which is honestly why I do like the Crystal Tower story. It's also not super duper long, but it sets up what is probably one of my favorite emotional highs in the MSQ while also explaining that the Allegans are always at fault for literally everything. They also invented everything, too. I totally remember the name of those two characters. Also, Nero got some solid development for what it's worth, along with Sid in the game. Good thing that this whole story arc is mandatory. So I'll work on that super long project some other time at some other point. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, you already know what to do. Now let's get out there and think of the wonders of Allegan technology.